So again, you said this is problem number five, right? So it's pretty clear from the problem that we're putting the heavier box on the, on the ramp and the lighter box we're hanging off the side of the ramp. So I'm going to use a capital M to represent the box that has the larger mass and a lowercase m to represent the box that has the smaller mass. Uh, for you guys who want to do it with numbers, that'll be a five and a two. Right. And this is how you'll get your answer, 20-something degrees. But again, I, I'm not going for the actual numerical answer. I'm going to go for something else. So we're told that this problem is set up so that it is in um, equilibrium, meaning it's not moving. So this is a net force equals zero problem. And once we know that, that kind of simplifies our work. Now, I want to be... If you're taking notes, then understand that it doesn't have to be at rest for this to be true. If I said it was sliding at constant speed, it would still be true. And there's some key words here, too, that you should pay very close attention to. They say it's a smooth surface. That's code for frictionless. On the test, though, don't assume... Meaning, if they don't say it's smooth or don't give an indication, they might be dealing with friction, and you might have to add that to your problem. Friction on a ramp is a tough problem, and we haven't done very much like that. I'm trying to get you guys to be able to handle the stuff we're having now. Friction on a ramp is tough because the direction tends to be somewhat obscure for folks. So we need to be careful about how you deal with friction. But this one, I take that away. Um, you still have to do all of the force things, but now you have to do it for two different objects. So I'll start with this object. It's experiencing two forces, weight downwards and tension upwards. They're balanced. So although direction doesn't really matter because they're balanced, I still think it best for you to get into the habit of picking common directions for positive. You guys okay back there? Did we lose something? Oh, sorry. Is everything all cool now? You have it back now? Yeah. Excellent. So by picking a common direction for positive, I'm choosing downwards is positive here. When I walked around and helped students, uh, look, there's like three levels of students. There's students who have no idea what to do. What, the things I'm saying right now, you're just copying down. You guys, are, you guys are in trouble. You need more work. You need more practice. Book's full of it. Um, there's people who have lots of pieces of it but don't know the order to put it in. For you, this, you'll benefit from this. Okay, add the direction clearly at the very beginning of the problem. Put arrows to tell you what direction is positive, but don't arbitrarily do it. Pick something that you use that's the same for both. That's where almost everybody got into trouble yesterday who was able to create an equation. They go, I can't, they, they don't cancel out. They only cancel out if you do this, and you need them to. So this is going to be mg minus t, but in this case it equals zero. So anytime we can work a zero in, that helps. Now, the box on the ramp is experiencing three forces as well. Weight downwards, normal force perpendicular to the ramp, and tension. Now, you have to decide on a coordinate system and break the off-axis component up, I'm sorry, the off-axis force into components. So all the things we've already done have to be done again. So I'm looking at something like that for your, your coordinate system. And I know you hate me saying this, but I'm kind of done doing all the trig. It's a ramp, so this is mg sine theta. I'm no longer gonna do the trig unless you specifically ask me to do so. And this one's gonna be mg cosine theta. Now in this problem, the mg cosine theta doesn't play a role at all. But had there been friction, it would have. The net force is still zero. So since the net force is zero, tension is in the positive direction, minus mg sine theta. In the negative direction, that equals zero. 
Now this problem was about finding the angle at which this system would be at rest. So I still see two relationships, one that has the angle in it. So if I'm trying to solve for the angle, I probably need to do something with it. I'm pretty sure I can eliminate tension between these two. Now, although you may not see where to go without the numbers, in this problem, the numbers are the capital M and the lowercase m. Those are the numbers. That's what they gave us. The five kilogram block is capital M. The two kilogram block is lowercase m. And we're trying to get a relationship that has to do with the angle. What you want to get rid of is the tension. We don't know what the tension is. So I'll add those two equations up. And just to make sure that you are spending adequate and sufficient time. I'm going to do it the way I've been doing the other problems to show you that you can just stack these two equations and when you add them together, the tensions cancel out. And we'll get mg minus mg sine theta. That equals zero. Yep. Unlike the test or quiz, will we have to show the stack? But... I, don't, I want to be really careful. Don't shortchange yourself. You know, if, you know, the AP graders need to see a, a clear line of reasoning. So do something to let them know what you're doing. Does that make sense? Okay. Now from here, we're trying to get theta by itself. So you can cancel the G's. Now, this is the answer to most of that problem. You can decide almost everything right there. First, if you go from having the five kilogram mass to the three kilogram mass, you can tell right away the angle has to increase. And that's just having to do with this fraction. To know that, you have to understand how sine changes when the angle changes. Sine gets bigger when the angle gets bigger. Now, you guys, Understand that this is what your test will look like. It's not going to have five kilograms and three kilograms. It's going to say there's a block on the table and a block hanging off the table. And then you're going to have to develop a relationship. And then you're going to be asked questions about the relationship. So you need to be able to point to this and say, well, I have that the sine of the angle equals this ratio. So knowing that sine gets bigger when the angle gets bigger is something you'll have to say. You can't assume the grader will know that or will give you the credit for that. Because cosine doesn't get bigger when the angle gets bigger. Cosine gets smaller when the angle gets bigger. They want to know if you know that sine gets bigger when the angle gets bigger. And then you're setting it equal to a fraction. If the top part of that fraction gets bigger, then the fraction gets bigger. They want to know that too. But they also want to know something else that's important here. There is no angle that will work if this fraction is greater than the number one which is why you can't hang the five kilogram mass off the edge and put any of the smaller blocks on the ramp. There is no angle where that will work because that will produce a fraction that's greater than one and there is no sign of an angle that is greater than one. That's the kind of stuff they expect you to know. And that's the kind of stuff you're supposed to come to this class with. Now, if you don't have that in your knowledge, I've just told you, those are the things they're looking for. They want you to know how sign works as a function and how you can apply it to a generic response like this. So all of those things are things you should probably put down if you were not familiar with it. First, that sine gets greater when the angle gets greater. That the sine of an angle can never be a value greater than one. Those are things that will help you answer these questions and are ways to answer the generic questions that come up about the system. Something else I would point out here too Oftentimes, they will produce a, an equation for you and ask you about parameters of that equation. You need to be able to discuss how a function changes when one of the parameters changes. So if capital M gets bigger, what does that do to the angle? That makes the angle smaller. They would want to know that you can figure that out from looking at the relationship. All right, that was question number five. Pretty Question number one is a modified Atwood machine without friction, I believe. 
and it had a box on the table and a box hanging off the table. And you were changing one of the masses. I think it's the one on the table, but you were not changing the one off the table. Again, I'm just going to do it just like this, same way. Uh, you can plug in numbers if you want. I, I don't see any reason to. <laughs> well, that's here. I have a pulley. A string there. And a string here. Oops. All right, so there's no friction in this problem. I'm going to make this the positive direction. I feel like a basket full of aluminum foil down there. So... The setup of this problem is very similar to what we just did, except without the angle. So I'm going to have mg downwards here, tension upwards, and I'm going to specifically draw the tension less than the weight because we know the system's going to accelerate. For the one that's on the platform, tension this way, and you should try and be intentional to make this length arrow the same as that length arrow. I'm not sure I did a good job, but you should be a, do a better job. Then I've got weight down and normal force up. Uh, we've done this problem several times in the notes, but we haven't done it quite like this. This side's gonna be tension equals mg, and this side is gonna be capital MG minus tension equals capital MA. Now, this problem was an AP question a couple years ago. It was left ambiguous like this, and then you were asked several questions about what would happen as, and they talked about adjusting the masses. So in this case, we're gonna eliminate the tension by adding these two things together, and we get capital MG equals the sum of the masses times A. We're interested in the acceleration This is the answer. And they're keeping this value constant. We're leaving that hanging, and it's the same mass for every trial. But you're changing this mass. You're making it bigger. So there are some things here that I think are not obvious that you should be able to speak to. Like what happens as the mass on the table gets really small? Now, very few of you probably noticed this. But as the mass on the table gets really small, that means this one here is getting closer and closer to zero. That means the system will accelerate close to G because there's nothing on the table that has inertia. So the mass that's hung just falls straight down. But the other side of this is also true. This thing never has an acceleration of zero. Regardless of how big the mass in the denominator is, there'll always be some amount of acceleration because this will never be a fraction that equals zero. Those are limits you should be looking at. That's the way the questions are going to be asked. What happens when the mass on the table is really small compared to what happens when the mass on the table is really big? Then they ask you to come up with a relationship about it. Then they ask questions about the relationship. Those are things you should be prepared to do. Now, if you want to just plug the numbers in, you should. All right? This one stays the same. This one's always going to be whatever, whatever I don't know, 10. And then you start adding whatever those masses are, 1, 5, 10, and 20. But again, this is what the answer looks like. Uh, that was question number one. Yeah? Okay. So something like this. And 
and we're applying a force to the smaller box. I think that's what it said. Yes. And M, 2M, and 3M. Right. We want the force between the boxes. I'm just going to save some time. There's a force that's going to be between these two boxes, right? There's a force that pushes on the 2M box to the right, and then an equal and opposite force that pushes on the 1M box to the left. I'm going to call that N1. And there's a force between these two boxes, a box that pushes, pushes on a 3M box to the right, and an equal and opposite force that pushes on the 2M box to the left. I'm going to call that N2, just to save us some time. So, I'm not going to worry about the vertical forces since there's no friction. So, the up and down, normal and weight, I'm not going to worry about. I am going to say that this is the positive direction. So, on the, little, on the single M box, there's a force this way, F. There's a force this way, N1. Any question about that? All right. On the 2M box... There's a force of this direction that has to be equal to the N1 force. And there has to be a force this way, which is equal to the N2 force. And I'm trying to make the forces of at least some appro you know, appropriate size to indicate that I think the system is accelerating to the right. And then the 3M box is experiencing the same force, N2, but acting on it to the right. These are our th third law pair forces. They're equal and opposite. Each one of these boxes accelerates. So I need to go and apply Newton's second law to each one. Net force equals MA. So on box one, that'll be the horizontal force, F, minus N1 equals MA. I'm making to the right positive. Any questions? All right. N1 minus N2 equals 2M times A. This box is more massive. I need to make sure I include its mass, which is 2M, not M. All righty. Then this box only has N2 acting on it, and that's going to be 3M times A. So we are trying to figure out the acceleration of the system and the forces between the boxes. Now, truth is, I'm not sure it asks what the acceleration of the system is, but it does ask what the force is between the boxes. And we can only have M and F in our answer. There are no fundamental constants here. So one thing we can do from the onset is recognize that I have three equations and three unknowns. You may not see it like this because they all look like they're unknowns, but they're not. A is an unknown. We're not allowed to have it in our answer. And one is an unknown. We're asked to solve for it. So N2 is also an unknown. We are asked to solve for it. Those are your unknowns. So you have to find a way to eliminate things that are not allowed in your answer. I find the best way to do this is to find the acceleration. I think it's the most straightforward way to do it instead of trying to eliminate acceleration because we can do it by adding these equations together. I've tried to show you that if you do this right, when you add the equations together, the internal forces will cancel out and will give you something from which you can work. If I add all three of these equations together, I'll have N1 and N1, one positive, one negative, they'll cancel out. And I'll have N2 and N2, one positive and one negative, they will cancel out. The left side of this all becomes just F. So I have negative N1 plus N1, those cancel out. And negative N2 plus N2, those cancel out. The right side of this, M plus 2M plus 3M.
Now, I've told you from the beginning, when you're doing these problems, you should look to see a point in the problem where you have the unbalanced force equal to the inertia of the system times the acceleration. That's what this is. The force doesn't know it's pushing on three boxes. The force is pushing on something that has inertia equal to 6m. So the acceleration here is going to be F divided by 6m. Can't use this answer for anything. But we can go back and plug it in to talk about what the different forces are. With numbers, that's what we've done before. We still have numbers this time. So I'm going to find N2 first. That's the easiest one. So N2 equals 3m times, and for the acceleration, I'm going to put F divided by 6m. Look, I know for a lot of you, this is like just a bunch of letters. It might not look like it means very much. But if done correctly, you should be able to see a bit of a pattern here. Do you notice that the M's cancel out? So I have one in the numerator and one in the denominator. This gives me one half F. Now, this tells you something important, that regardless of how hard you push on the first box, N2 is gonna be half of that force. So that's going to be the force between these two boxes, one half of the applied force. Now, if you want to find N1, you need to find a place to put it. I'm going to choose this one. It doesn't really matter. One of these is not easier to use than the other. I'm using this one because I can put the acceleration there, and I don't have to count on having gotten N2 correct to get the correct answer there. So that's why I'll put it there. So... That's going to be F minus N1 equals M times F over 6M. Do you notice that the mass cancels again? So I can cancel out the M's. And this is 1 sixth F. This side is still F minus N1. I'm solving for N1. So I'm going to move N1 to this side of the equation and move 1 sixth F to that side of the equation. Some of you do not like fractions. And if you're scared of them, get over it. This is 6 sixth minus 1 sixth. So it's 5 6th F. You can do it decimals if you want, but I don't see any need to. Now this tells you that there's a lot of force between these two boxes. I hope it doesn't crush the little box. But those are the two answers. Now you have to take the force and put it on the other side. Uh, I'll leave that as your exercise. All right. Mass 15 kilograms are connected by thin light cord in our polar plastic table where there is a coefficient of magnetic friction of 0 .0 or 0.4. If the blocks are pulled so that they slide at a constant velocity, what is the tension and all this thing? All right. It's more or less the same problem we just did, just with some friction instead. And the last night. Like That's not what the problem says. So, something like that. Pulling three blocks across the surface. They're all the same size block, so all 15 kilograms. Um, again, I would probably do the problem with just M, but you do it however you see fit. Uh, when I say this problem, it's just like the last one. Uh, I'm going to call this T for tension, 
between these two blocks, I'm gonna call that T1, between these two blocks, T2. So there's gonna be some Newton's third law forces here. First block is experiencing force of tension this way. T1 this way, friction this way, weight this direction, and normal force that direction. Yep. They're all experiencing friction, right? Does, is it frictionless on this one? No, there's friction on it, right? Number 10? They give us a value of 0.4 between the table and the blocks. So I'm pretty sure we have to, we're going to have to use friction here. But I still think these are the forces that are acting in this system. Am I good to keep going? Did I answer your question? Yes. All right. The next block is going to experience T1 this way, T2 this way, and friction this way. And the last box is going to experience T2 this way and friction this way. The blocks are pulled at a constant velocity. And that force equals zero. Yep. Are you, like, deciding whether or not to put the normal force or the weight? I'm going to put the normal force and the weight in for all of them. They're all the same, though. The boxes are all the same mass. So, like, if they ask us to make the free body, we would have to add You them. have to have them all. If we're doing, like, our own work, we would have to include it. If it's not being checked for credit, I wouldn't worry about it. I'd do whatever makes it work for you. Now... There's not a lot of shortcuts here, but there is a, at least one. Friction equals mu times the normal force. For all of these boxes, they all have the same mass. As, I'm sorry, they all have the same mass. So in the y direction for all of these boxes, the net force is zero, and normal equals mg. All the boxes are the same mass. So all the boxes experience the same normal force from the table. And friction is connected to normal force. So all the boxes are experiencing the same frictional force. That's only true because the boxes have the same coefficient and the same mass. If there's something else, if there's different coefficients or different masses, you wouldn't be able to make this... this uh, um, Simplification, but they're all going to have the same friction because they all have the same normal force and coefficient of friction in this problem. So that at least makes the Fs pretty easy. But I, I still have to do the rest of the work. It's still tension minus T1 minus friction equals zero. That has to be true for the first block. I'm just looking in the X direction. Then I have, for the next block, T1 minus T2 minus friction equals zero. And for the last block, T2 minus friction equals zero. We're allowed to have, we're, we're supposed to find the tensions, the T1s, the Ts, and all that. I can have mu in my answer, I can have M in my answer, I can have G in my answer, or I can just put the numbers in, because they gave us that they're all 15, coefficient of friction is 0.4, G is 10. I'm going to put the numbers in at the last stage. I'm not going to put them in at this stage. But I am going to um, add all these together to try and get an expression what tension is. So that's where I'm going to start. Now, to be honest with you, probably the place I should start is here. That would probably be easiest. The system's not accelerating. And the other problems, the system was accelerating. I can find T2 directly right now. It's mu mg. Since the system's not accelerating, it's pretty easy to find T2. Now you can plug in mu and, or sorry, 0.4, 15, and 10 if you want. 
I still feel like it. Since I know T2, then that makes T1 pretty easy to find. T1 minus T2, which is mu mg, minus friction, which is also mu mg, equals zero. That has to be true too, which means T1 equals two mu mg. Right, it did say the system wasn't accelerating, right? Well, now I have T1, so I can figure out what the tension is on the first block. T minus T1, which is two mu mg, minus friction, which is mu mg, equals zero. So T equals three mu mg. Those are your answers. Yes, plug in 0.4 and 15 and all that. The only thing that would make this problem harder is if it was accelerating to the right. If it was accelerating to the right, then you'd have an MA here and an MA here and an MA here. And you'd have to figure out that acceleration. This was a simplification because it was moving at a constant velocity. Yes, sir? So constant velocity means that it's like it's an Mm-hmm. Yep. All right, I think that was all. I think number 11 is similar, same as pull up on the blocks. But it accelerates, but there's no friction. So. Anything else? I had a feeling because that's where the answers ended, right? But not where the problems ended. So, yes, sir? I don't know what number nine is. This is an excellent question. Yeah, I probably won't repeat it. I think once you've seen it this way, the, although it, it is a different question, repeating it. Uh, you guys ought to do something for homework tonight. He said, I didn't come by and check your work. Just keep in mind, this problem is tough. If you're not really paying attention, it's impossible. Consider this. It's static friction. That's your condition. Now, this problem might look really challenging. It's not as hard as you might think for one simple reason. This box is only experiencing one force that's causing it to accelerate. And I don't know if you guys have picked up on it, but that box is experiencing only three forces. It's experiencing a downward force, mg, an upward force, n, and a frictional force this way. The static frictional force is that direction. That's what's accelerating that box. If you didn't pick up on that, you will not be able to solve this problem. But the bigger box is trying to slide out from underneath the top box. So you have to imagine that bigger box is sliding past it. It's pulling on the top box. If there was no friction, this box would just sit in place. And when the big box was out of the way, it would just fall to the ground. You know that mu s can be written as mu s mg. And you know that the net force in the x direction equals ma. You can find the acceleration of the system before you do the problem. Because this is equal to ma. 
If you do this substitution, so that you're subbing into the inequality, you know the maximum acceleration of the system. That's how you figure out what's the largest force you can apply to the bottom box. It can't accelerate more than this. 2M and 3M are in a row on a frictionless table. You apply... So those are our three boxes, and they are mass M, 2M, and 3M. And the system is experiencing a force against, you know, I did the, uh, the problem already once against the little box. So I'm just going to do this one against the big box. And that way both sides of the problem have been done. It's the exact same problem, so it's really not a huge change. So we'll say that the force is from this side. And it is a value F. And my understanding is it's on a frictionless surface, so no friction is present. We want to figure out the force between the boxes. Um, do we know the acceleration? Are we? Do we have to figure out the acceleration too? Can't remember. Doesn't matter really. It just says find the forces between the blocks. Right. So I'm going to name this force N2 and this force N1 because those are the same names I used when I did the problem the other way earlier. That way, if you're referencing both problems, I'm being consistent. And I'm saying N1 and N2. Uh, N1 is the force on block M from 2M. Um, and N2 is the force on the block 2M from 3M. In reverse, N2 is also the force on box 3M from 2M. And N1 is also the force on box 2M from just M. So those are the, the two forces that are acting between the system. Sorry, between the boxes. Um, there's no friction, which means I really don't have to worry about the, the up and down forces in this problem. I can draw the arrows if, you're, if you care, but they're just going to sum to be zero, and I never need the normal force from the floor on any of the boxes. Now, this wouldn't be true if there is a coefficient of friction. If there's friction, then I would probably have to worry about that normal force from the floor. And if you're asked to draw a free body diagram, you better draw all the forces. But if all I need is to solve the problem, well, then I'm going to ignore the up and down forces and focus just on the sideways forces. So, and it's just to make this a little bit neater. I have a force that way. And then I have a force this way, which I will purposely draw shorter and label N2. Any questions? All righty. Yep. And how did you know that the forces are going this way and not with the force applied? All right, so I'm not sure to what you're referring. Are you, worried, are you asking why this force is to the left? No. Why this force is to the right? There's a surface right here. The force has to be perpendicular to the surface, so that would mean it would have to be this way. Oops. It would have to be this way off of that surface. Does that make sense? Excellent. All right, so moving on to box two. It's experiencing a normal force in this direction, N2. This is the Newton's third law pair, and it occurs at this surface. And it has to be equal and opposite to the other force acting in the other direction on the other box. Everything good there? All right. However, there's also a force this way, N1, which I'll purposely draw smaller than N2. This is the force that occurs at this boundary. Does that make sense? All righty. And finally, the wee little box is experiencing just N1. All right, so those are my the boxes. And I'm going to assume the whole system is accelerating in this direction, so I'm going to make this the positive direction. <coughs> well, I assume. So, have I deviated yet from any of the steps I've given you guys? No. Okay. I'm trying to be careful and deliberate, and now I'm going to say this is a net force equals MA problem. The system is accelerating. I'm going to apply that to each of the boxes. 
Let's go to box number 3M and start there. I have F to the left, that makes that positive, minus N2 to the right, and that has to equal 3MA. Any question there? Don't forget, it's 3M. That's how massive the box is. Box in the middle, N2 minus N1 equals 2MA. Any questions? All right. N1 equals MA. I got no numbers. And at this point, I think even a shrewd student probably might be confused about where to go. Now, I told you that all Newton's laws would do is provide you with relationships. In this case, one relationship for every object with mass. So we have three relationships. You're asked to figure out what N1 and N2 is. And you can't have, you know, you can't have any of the other Ns in your answer. So I can't solve this and say this is the answer for N1. I don't know what the acceleration is. I'm not allowed to have acceleration in my answer. Um, I can't solve this for N2. Because I'll still have acceleration in my answer. And I can't solve this for either because I'll have the other one in the answer. So although I've reached a point where I've done everything correct, none of these are the answer. Truthfully, I have three unknowns. And one is an unknown. Oops, I underlined the wrong one. And <laughs> one is an unknown. Oh, Mr. Shelton. And two is an unknown, and one is an unknown, and acceleration is an unknown. Three equations, three unknowns. The only way you're going to be able to solve this is to eliminate the unknowns, to leave you with what you're allowed to have in your answer. Believe it or not, probably the best way to go is to find the acceleration. <clears throat> if I find the acceleration, I can find N1 here by plugging the acceleration in here. And if I find the acceleration, I can plug it in here to find out what N2 is. Yeah? Other than the fours, is there unknown? I'm allowed to have it in my answer. So it was given to us. And I know why you're asking that, and just like M. M feels like an unknown as well, but I'm allowed to have it in my answer. So part of the reason I stopped and talked about the difference between an unknown and a known is that they really gave us that it's a hundred Newton force acting on a box of five kilograms, 10 kilograms, and 15 kilograms. But that's really what they gave us. They just didn't use numbers for that. So it's an F force acting on box M, 2M, and 3M. But it could have been those numbers too. Those were the givens in the problem. We had to come up with things to use for N1 and N2. And we were told it accelerated, but we're not to have the acceleration in our answer. It's not obvious, but this is how you figure out what you can treat as an unknown and what you can treat as something that is given to you. I'm going to treat the problem the exact same way I've treated all the other ones. I'm going to stack these three equations and add them together. If I've been consistent, the internal forces will cancel out, and I'll be left with something that I can use to find the acceleration. So that's where I'm going to go from here. I'm going to take each of these, stack them together, And recognize that when I do this, I have a negative N2 and a positive N2. Those will cancel out when I sum. And I have a negative N1 and a positive N1. Those will cancel out when I sum. So when I do the sum on the left side, I just have F. When I do the sum on the right side, I have M plus 2M plus 3M times A. I factored out the A. This is purposeful. This is to demonstrate that if you do these problems in the correct manner, you will reach a point where you get net force equals mass of the system times A every time. You see this, you know you're doing the problem right. And you know you set the signs up to be correct. Now, 
this just gives me an expression for the acceleration. The acceleration is F over 6M. I don't need the acceleration. That wasn't something they asked me to find, but I have it now. But I could also use it. I could use it right here. If I plug in the acceleration here, I eliminate A as an unknown, and I have an answer that will just be in terms of F and M. That's what I was asked to do. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that N1 equals M times F over 6M. The M's cancel. So N1 equals 1 sixth F. There's lots to look at here, but big banner thing, N1 has to be a force. Notice what I have over there is something that's in terms of force. It's one sixth of the applied force. It also makes sense that N1 gets bigger if F gets bigger. All these things make sense. Maybe not sense to you, but it makes sense. Um, I have to find N2. I would use this relationship. If you made a mistake finding N1, you'll replicate that mistake here. But if you didn't make a mistake finding the acceleration and you plug it in here, you should be able to get N2 without much difficulty. So that's what I'm going to do. F minus N2 equals 3M times A, which is F equals, I'm sorry, F divided by 6M. Do you notice again that the M's cancel? So I'll cancel the M's. F minus N2 equals 1 half F. I'm not scared of fractions. I'm going to move N2 to this side and 1 half F to this side so I can combine like terms and isolate N2. So N2 will equal F minus 1 half F. And now N2 equals 1 half F. And yeah, that's it. Those are your answers. So we have a block on the table that has a mass of capital M. This is your five kilogram block. And we're told that we connect it by way of a pulley to a block that hangs off the table. And that we're gonna continuously change the block that hangs off the table until we uh, are able to get a block that slides at a constant velocity across the table. They say that occurs when the block is two kilograms, but again, I'm going to treat this like a, a problem where I don't have that information and we'll plug our numbers in at the end. Okay. So under this circumstance, we're told the system is going to move, and I think the reasonable direction it moves is this direction. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, so I'm going to call that the positive direction, even though there's no acceleration in part A. Right, they say the block moves at constant velocity after it's tapped. We know that that is giving us information to use later about friction. So we should probably keep that in mind. The block on the table is experiencing four forces. And in this case, they're all important forces, so I'm going to indicate all of them on my free body diagram. Those are the four forces experienced by the block on the table. Any question about that? Net force equals zero, because the block slides at a constant velocity in part A. So for all of those, I'll have T minus friction equals zero, and normal minus mg equals zero. Yeah, I applied Newton's laws correctly, I believe. Um, I'm gonna go to the block that's hanging. 
it's experiencing a downwards force, mg, and an upwards force, tension. And in this case, these two are also balanced, yep. You're talking about this. Sorry, you're talking about this? Yeah, you know, like, and I get it. Um, sure. <laughs> sure. That would probably be more correct. You understand it doesn't matter, though, right? For this block, for what you're asking. If I put mg minus n, is that going to change the result here? No. It won't. No, it's not accelerating in that direction. But you're right. Technically, I should have had the negative here and the positive here. So you're correct. Now, if I'd made that mistake over here, I'd be in big trouble. You need to be consistent for direction for the problem. Yes? It's not accelerating. The problem says sliding at constant velocity. So it's not accelerating. And look, um, you're not the only one making that mistake. I think a lot of people are. And I think you should really hammer that into your notes, folks. The word constant velocity is the thing you're looking for there. The conditions are not the same for all these problems. But that is something that is always going to be the same. Constant velocity means net force is zero. It doesn't have to be standing still. But you get used to this rut that if it's standing still, it's zero, and it's moving, it's not. That's not true. That's not the conditions, though, between the two types of friction, which you also have to be aware of and be paying attention to. Only in this one does the velocity have to be zero. That's important. For this one... It can be a net force equals zero problem or a net force equals MA problem. It just has to be moving. Those conditions are different than the Newton law conditions. So, you're yawning now, but later, 8 o'clock, all of a sudden, everybody's going to be all awake and want me to be awake. I don't think that's going to happen tonight. Yawn in my class. Jeez. So, um, mg minus t equals zero. Now, the, the thing that this unit is about is the fact that we are connecting these objects together by some internal force. The internal force here is the tension. Right? That is our Newton's third law force. So, we believe the tension on one is equal to the tension on the other. So, I'm going to take the T minus F that's here, and I'm going to use it to try and figure out what our problem's about. Um, right now, I have kind of several things going on all at once. First, I have this stuff going on on the table. We're trying to find out what the coefficient of friction is. We put a certain mass hanging off the table, and it caused the system to move at a constant velocity after you broke static friction. Notice that phrasing, after you broke static friction. That's purposeful. That statement's not in there by accident. It's to indicate that we are not using this. We're not using the conditional force. We're using the force of kinetic friction, which is a constant. That's an important distinction. Now, once we've made that distinction, it also means that we can bring some things together. For example, friction is equal to mu k times mg. I know the normal force acting on the block on the table is mg. I know that by looking right here. So now I have an expression for the frictional force. Well, if I have an expression for the frictional force, I also have an expression for the tension now. Now, how did I know to do all this? I just looked at what was given. When the net force is equal to zero and it gave us friction, I looked closely at the frictional portion of the problem. Finding a way to work in the coefficient of friction, which we're supposed to be looking for. And I know I haven't put a number in here. If you put numbers in here, you'd probably know which one is the unknown. But 
I know that this one is the unknown. But I also know that a few seconds before that, this was an unknown. I'm eliminating those, trying to work in the values that were given. Capital M was given, lowercase m was given, G was given. And I was told the conditions of the problem. So now I have something I can use here for the tension. This might give me a way to figure out what mu is. Because that's what the first part of the problem was. So I get mg equals mu k big M G. Now, if you've been working the problem with the 2 kilograms and the 5 kilograms, then you've got 20 equals mu times 50. Point 0.4. If you plug in the numbers, you get 0.4. Questions to this point? All right. So I'm going to tuck that away. This is now a known quantity. This equals 0.4. I can't even write it over there. It's just too far to the side. I'm in trouble. There. Now I can write it. All right, so now you have to repeat the problem. We make this mass bigger. Most all of the, everything I've written here is reusable. Because it's reusable, I'm not doing the whole problem over again. I'm going to recognize the parts of the problem that are reusable and, and try to, you know, be a little more efficient. This changed right here. T minus friction does not equal zero. T minus friction equals MA. It's accelerating. And that's the one on the table, so I should make that the big M times A. That's reusable. The one hanging off the table, it's accelerating too. So it's not mg minus t equals zero, it's mg minus t equals little m A, where this now has moved from two to three kilograms. Now, those are some reusable parts. I like the reusable parts. There's also a few other reusable parts. The fact that friction is equal to mu mg, that's going to be reusable. I already found it once. I'm going to reuse that. So let's bring the pieces to this, for this problem together. We've got a little bit up and out of the way. Let's start with this mg minus t equals ma. That's a reusable part. Yeah, I know. This is 3. If you're desperate to put your numbers in there, go for it. I don't care. I'm not. t minus f equals capital ma. But f is still the same amount. The friction is a constant. The actual value of the force never changed. So this is going to be T minus mu K mg equals ma. I do have an unknown, no acceleration. So this problem is like the other Atwood machine problems. Probably put those together. When I put those together, the internal force, tension will cancel out, leaving me with the external forces that I can use to figure out what the acceleration is. So... Let's add those together. Little m g minus mu k big M g equals little m plus big M times a. These are the two forces acting on the system. Gravity is pulling on the little mass, and friction is trying to keep the system from moving. That's why one is positive and one is negative. That should be an obvious kind of thing. You should be seeing that or looking for that. Total mass of the system. Good, glad to, glad to see that there. Now, plugging the numbers in, that's on you guys. 30 minus 0.4 times 50 equals 3 plus 5 times A. You can do that. I don't care about the numbers. You do. There you go, number 4. So... 
let's start with uh, the basics. Uh, I think this system's accelerating. Why? They say it in a problem. And I'm interested in something that's gonna happen later. I'm not gonna draw the floor in, or at least I'm not gonna leave the floor in there. But eventually, we wanna figure out when one of these hits the ground. Um, I think we're gonna need to figure out how fast it's accelerating in order to figure out when it's gonna hit the ground. So we know they're both a meter off the ground. Only one's gonna hit the ground though, right? Probably M2 if it's the heavier. So I'll leave that to later. I'm gonna make this direction the positive direction for the problem. I'm saying to you that M2 is greater than M1, so I should expect the arrow for gravity for M2 to be greater than the arrow for gravity for M1. And M2 accelerates downwards, while M1 accelerates upwards. But they have the same tension, so I'm gonna make the arrow for tension longer than M1G and shorter than M2G, but the same size on both meaning the tensions are the same size. But I'm purposely misbalancing or unbalancing those upwards on this side and unbalancing those downwards on this side. All of that is done on purpose and is what I will be using as a grade rubric when you have to do this on a test. This would probably be worth three total points, but it won't be for the arrows themselves, but how the arrows are related to each other. Um, net force equals MA, it's a second law problem. Based on my direction for positive, this is positive, and this is positive. Don't forget that stuff, you will. This is going to be T minus MG equals MA. I'm using lowercase m here. Oh, wait, I have numbers. Let's see, T minus M1G equals M1A, there. The other side, M2G minus T equals M2A. There, done all the math. Oh, I'm sorry, I've done all the physics part. I've done the Newton's law part. Now you have to find a way of figuring out what the acceleration is. That means eliminating the internal force tension. M's were given. So if you want to find the acceleration, you need to get rid of the tension. Uh, pretty sure this will be the way to do it. So. This will be M2G minus M1G equals M1 plus M2 a. So 450 minus 350 equals 80 A. Right? So A is 10 eighths, 4 fifths, I'm sorry, 5 fourths, or 1.25 meters per second squared. Initial velocity was zero. Displacement is one meter. Find the final velocity. Find the time.